Hello, everyone. I'm Diane Butler. I'm the director of the Binghamton University Art Museum, and I'm very happy to introduce our alumnus and uh, friend, Bill Volkley, class of 61. He recently retired from the Morgan Library and Museum, where he was the chief manuscript curator. And uh, we're delighted to be able to have his collection of fakes and forgeries at the museum. Uh, we'll have that on view from September 10th through December 12th. And uh, welcome, Bill. Oh, thank you. So um, you, uh, as graduating from Binghamton University, or it was Harper College at the time, uh, I understand that you didn't really plan on having a career in manuscripts. Is that right? Absolutely right. My BA is in mathematics, but I took a uh, eye-opening uh, Art 101 survey course with Ken Lucy, Lindsay, and this completely uh, altered my life. I spoke to my uh, guidance counselor, who was horrified that in my senior year I wanted to change my major, but he convinced me to finish the, the degree in mathematics, which I did. So then I came back to Harper for a fifth year, took all of the art history courses and French, and thereafter applied to Columbia University for graduate school, which I did. Uh, but while I was at Harper, I was uh, reminded when I came across this, that my first art, art exhibition that I curated was actually at Harper College. And it was a display of high quality reproductions of uh, Dutch and Flemish drawings. Uh, and here is the title page for the mimeographed catalog, a <laughs> rare item. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so what was it that um, led you to, I don't know, study and then finally collect uh, known forgeries? Yes, well, when I first came to the Morgan uh, over 50 years ago, I was green as could be, and a visitor brought in two leaves and I didn't recognize the style. I asked my colleague, John Plummer, uh, what these were. And he said, oh, well, they're by the Spanish forger. Uh, and this opened my eyes because I didn't realize that a forger could have a style in an art history. And then I found out that the Spanish forger had an earlier history at the Morgan because it was none other than Bel de Costa Green, the first director who in 1930 debunked a painting uh, which had been attributed to Maestro Jorge Anglés, depicting the betrothal of Ursula. Uh, she said, well, the, the forger was passed off as Spanish, so she nicknamed the forger her friend, the Spanish forger. Then she began to make a list of his works, uh, and this list was continued by John Plummer, who brought it up to 50 examples, and then I came on the scene and continued the tradition. And now there are over 400 documented works by the Spanish forger. So naturally, having this close connection with uh, the Spanish forger, I thought it might be nice to own a few examples. And in this picture of me made some 30 years ago, I'm actually holding the martyrdom of uh, St. Lawrence, and this gives you an idea of how big uh, this uh, folio leaf actually was. So how many Spanish forger objects do you own? I own about 13. 13. Uh, and I think that's probably enough. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're actually all on view in the exhibition. The, um, the rest of the works on the ex in the exhibition uh, also coming from your collection, which is how many objects in total? Well, 67 mm. six items. I, I was rather surprised uh, when I had to tally them up how many I had, because I had mm. to write catalog entries for all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we have about 50 of those on view right now. 50, well, that's good. Five, something oh, like great. that. And as many folks know, we were planning to open the exhibition back in mid-March. We were actually two days away from opening when we needed to go into shutdown because of the coronavirus. Um, but 
our art director, uh, Blazio Kovetrovic, needed to change our poster, our hallway poster for the exhibition. Here it is, Holy Hoaxes, a curator collects. Um, but he was able to correct the now error in a true medieval style, that is by using an elongated sort of creature to cover up the earlier date and then with pen and ink, draw your attention down to the new dates of the exhibition. <laughs> the uh, uh, poster actually uh, used one of the items in the show for the subject of the historian initial. Uh, so I would challenge visitors to the show to see if they could find it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> now, how was it that um, you became interested in forgeries? And um, tell us about this one by, by um, the Spanish forger. Yes, well, uh, after deciding that it would be nice to have a few, Mm -hmm. uh, I went to an auction at Doyle Galleries in 1974, and lo and behold, there was this magnificent painting, by, which I recognized was by the Spanish forger. It had been cataloged as German. Uh, so I went to the auction hoping to get it, uh, and uh, somebody was bidding against me, and they kept bidding up and up and up. And I realized that this would be one of the centerpieces for my planned exhibition at the Morgan, because I wanted to pull all this stuff together. Uh, and the gentleman was not at all pleased when I told him what he had bought. He thought he was buying a 15th century original, and it was the big discovery of the auction, so he refused to pick it up. I went to uh, the gallery director after the sale, uh, told him what he had, and he sold it to me for practically nothing. So that's how I got this wonderful example of the Spanish forger. But owners of these fakes, of course, are, are determined to do whatever they can to prove that they're genuine. So I felt it would be good to use something other than style to do this. Unfortunately, I had connections at the Brookhaven National Laboratory, and they used the technique of neutron activation analysis uh, uh, and discovered that the green pigment was emerald or Paris green, which was only available commercially in 1814. So this could not be a 15th century painting, uh, but I was able to show uh, that actually the painting was much later uh, than the 19th century, uh, and probably this was done in the early 20th century. Uh, and it was because uh, I had amassed so many examples uh, of the forger's work that I was able to establish this. If you have one or two paintings, what can you say? When you have 400, and you notice that the provenances, for the most part, are Paris. The subject matter is Parisian for many of them, as in this case. Uh, and as the uh, forger used books published by Paul Lacroix in French, uh, uh, which was illustrated with chromolithographs, and these were his uh, primary sources. So I was therefore pretty much uh, able to establish that these were mostly uh, early 20th century works, uh, and not a single one had a record of sale before, two th uh, before, uh, uh, oops, before uh, 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 1900, and this of course also confirmed the uh, late date. Mm -hmm. uh, this shows Martha taming the Tarasque. Uh, she uh, went up to France after the crucifixion, and there she performed miracles. The one in the center uh, was done with holy water, which she sprinkled on this man-eating demon, uh, tied it up with her girdle, and led it away. So that's the story of St. Martha. Um, Doing an exhibition of forgeries was, I mean, the response at, at Binghamton has been quite interesting. People have never heard of such a thing. I wonder how your exhibition uh, was reviewed. Well, you know, uh, the terms that any museum director never wants to hear about something in the collection is fake or forgery. And therefore, Charles Reiskamp, the director of the Morgan at the time, was quite apprehensive because the art critic of the New York Times was Hilton Kramer, who is a sort of no-nonsense kind of guy. So he was 
hearing of horrible reviews. Says, Why is the Morgan showing this stuff? They have all these beautiful medieval manuscripts. Well, anyway, his fears were absolutely misplaced. Hilton Kramer loved the show, called him a master uh, 19th century medievalist. And he added, uh, it's something first to be accepted uh, as genuine, then debunked, then studied and honored, even when unmasked. Many a genuine artist, he wrote, received less from posterity, uh, given a one-man show at the Morgan Library. Uh, and this exhibition is a landmark because it was the first ever devoted to a single forger. And when was it? Uh, uh, that was Hilton Kramer, uh, art critic yeah. the New York Times. When, when did that occur? Oh, 1978. Uh, that's when the show uh, opened. Mm -hmm. uh, and then John uh, Ashbery, the poet, he also did a review, and he was troubled when he looked at a painting like the one shown here, uh, where these crusaders are probably being ripped off at a high price to buy these relics, presumably of a saint. The subject must have appealed to the forger. Um, and he said, you know, I'm very troubled because I look at this and I moved the same way uh, mm -hmm. that I moved when I look at a work of art. I mean, he felt, found it very compelling. And so he raised the question, uh, could a work of art only be a work of art when it was genuine? Uh, and he concluded, no, that mm -hmm. it could be appreciated as a forgery and as a work of art. Interesting. Now we've been looking at two Spanish forger paintings. Um, did he also do, well, we know he also did manuscripts. Um, yeah. So can you yes. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely right. Because Bel de Costa Green, who was in charge you know, of the biggest collection of manuscripts, probably would have lost interest until she discovered uh, that he did uh, manuscripts and in far greater numbers than panel paintings. And she must have been a little embarrassed when she discovered in 1909 she herself had been fooled and bought a manuscript by the Spanish forger. So this, of course, piqued her uh, interest. Uh, and thus far, for example, uh, I have cataloged 291 leaves. And by having such a large number, I was able to show or demonstrate that these were probably done in France uh, and in Paris, which was not only a great center of consequential art movements, but it was a great center of forgery production. Mm -hmm. So because most of these came from out of Paris, most of them had French subject matter, and many uh, were based on chromolithographs that were published in uh, uh, French art books in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s by Paul Lacroix. And that certainly was the case for this uh, martyrdom of St. Lawrence, which is the one that I was photographed with. Uh, but in a way, these are both real and non-real mm -hmm. because the manuscript part is real. Uh, and the forger simply added the miniature and the borders. So he gussied up what would have been an unillustrated choir book leaf added the miniature and borders, and then got a much higher price for it. Uh, so Let's take so, a little deeper dive into this, how you know that he added this. Because there's, as, as you've explained it to me, there's evidence right on the, the leaf um, of his forgery. So let's, let's go into that a little bit. Right. Well, now one of the uh, uh, discoveries that I made, which was very exciting to me at least, was that the, mart that the martyrdom was based on a, a real French manuscript in Paris at the Institut de France. There it is. Uh, but uh, it turned out that uh, this was not the source for many, many other pictures. Only two miniatures in this missile were used by the Spanish forger, and these were both reproduced as chromolithographs, so that the forger used these chromolithographs rather than the original. So this was a, a big uh, breakthrough. Now here we've um, shown a detail of both the Spanish forger's um, piece on the left and on the right, uh, 
a reproduction of the original manuscript. Tell us right. about the different uses of the historiated letter here. And what we're speaking of is, are these large letters here and here? You can see how they're used differently. Tell us about that. Yes, well, this actually had uh, a, an initial there, uh, so that the forger yeah. just added the miniature, and he probably added some gold there. But the reason that we know that this was unillustrated would be that there would be a rubric at the top of the miniature saying that this is for the feast day of St. Lawrence, but the rubric is down here. So you know that this was not meant to, to receive a miniature. But let's look at the next picture. So here we have the forger's work and the chromolithograph. So the forger's so, on the left and the chromolithograph, yes. a book illustration on the on, right. On the, on the right. So he never copied things exactly. This was part of his charm, but he used ingredients. He was like the cook who wanted to use real ingredients and put them together in a slightly different way. But some of the things were uh, borrowed rather directly. The blue, for example, of the person here, the blue robe, uh, the fall of the drapery. Uh, but then uh, there were a few other changes. Uh, St. Lawrence is now much more modest, the way the hands cover up the certain private parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but the flames are there. Uh, so, um, uh, and in the original, uh, the faces of the tormentors, uh, we'll see a detail in a moment, uh, are very mean looking. But in the chromolithograph, uh, which was done uh, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, they tended to make the faces prettier and less menacing. Mm -hmm. So this was part, this reflected the sort of 19th century sentimental view toward the Middle Ages. Uh, and this is even more apparent in our next picture comparison. Uh, where we have uh, the fellow who's tormenting <coughs> uh, 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 Lawrence by making the flames even hotter with the use of the bellows. But in the original manuscript on the far right, the tormentor is really pumping on the bellows, making that fire hotter and hotter. But the chromolithographer has been rather vague, so it's not quite clear that his foot is on the bellows at all. And the Spanish forger, based on the chromolithograph, uh, has the bellows completely uh, separate from the foot. So this really showed that the forger used these uh, chromolithographs rather than the originals. Now, I understand that there were other forgers uh, working at the same time. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Paris was uh, also a great center for forger production. They did everything, enamels, metalwork, sculptures. Uh, but there were actually uh, people who were faking manuscripts uh, earlier in the, in, in the 19th century. But they usually did patriotic themes like Joan of Arc, French royalty, Life of St. Louis, and so forth. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have this confrontation between Agnes Sorel and Charles VII. And Agnes Sorel was painted, of course, by Jean Fouquet uh, mm -hmm. in a very famous painting uh, where she is shown breasts exposed uh, as the Virgin Mary. I mean, sort of scandalous. But it was one of the great masterpieces by Jean Fouquet. And in fact, this uh, piece was offered to the Morgan as a work by Fouquet for $27,500. And I pointed out to the owner that, sorry, this is, these are not portraits of Agnes Sorel and the king. They're caricatures. And moreover, uh, the figure of Agnes Sorel is based on a very famous playing card, which is reproduced in the uh, Le Croix volumes. And there it is. And of course, uh, the owners uh, did not accept this. They said, oh no, uh, the playing card is based on the miniature rather than the other way around. Uh, so they tried to explain everything uh, uh, before admitting that the thing is bogus. Anyway, I wanted to buy this for, for the collection. I had to wait 20 years until it came up at auction in London as a forgery. <laughs> so I got it. So I got it in the end at a fraction of the uh, original asking price.
Well done. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so I understand the the interest in the Spanish forger and other forgers working at this at the same time. Um, why did you have an interest in expanding your collection even here to a drawing? Well, I want to expand it because I realized had there been a data bank of forgeries, I would have probably known about the Spanish forger. So it's very useful to have a, a data bank where you have reproduced all the, the kinds of forgeries, how they were made, what they look like. So this would be a very useful thing for students and dealers alike. And so I saw this exhibition uh, as a way of going beyond the Spanish forger and making perhaps a, a, a starting gesture in, in the direction of forming such a data bank. Uh, so you will see uh, in the exhibition, which, by the way, is itself another landmark, because this is the first exhibition ever devoted to manuscript forgeries in general. So people will see Mex uh, uh, Indian forgeries, Islamic forgeries, uh, other European forgeries, such as this leaf in front of you, which is a drawing uh, in Gothic style which generated great interest because it recalled one of the battle scenes in the Morgan's greatest Gothic manuscript, um, the Old Testament picture book made for St. Louis. So I showed this to various experts. Um, and of course, the limits of expertise are sometimes shockingly revol uh, <laughs> revealed when this is done. Uh, but one of them thought that it was Gothic, and then I showed it to Jonathan Alexander. One of the advantages of working in the Morgan Library is that all the great manuscript scholars come in, you know, from time to time, and I can uh, ask them for their opinions. And he said, well, this reminded uh, him of the work of Matthew Paris, an English artist of the mid-13th century, who did such battle scenes. Uh, unfortunately, we had a, an article published on the drawings of Matthew Paris uh, uh, in 1926. And so we went to the stacks and got it. And what we found is in the next slide. Boing! <laughs> Never did something go from genuine to forgery so quickly. Right. So one of the great uh, means of forgery detection is to, is to find the source. In this case, it was an actual size publication in this uh, uh, periodical. Uh, however, I did go to the British uh, uh, Library where the original is, and it shows off of killing an opponent with a spear, uh, that there's actually more to the miniature. Uh, because the manuscript was so tightly bound, they could not get uh, what was in the gutter so that the feet actually go beyond. But the forgery reproduces the reproduction and not the original. So that made it absolutely clear that this was done from the reproduction, uh, and it was therefore done after 1926. Uh, this, in spite of the hoopla, it was discovered, so-called, uh, uh, in a binding uh, in 1999 uh, in the Netherlands, sandwiched between pages of a 15th century incunable. So mm -hmm. all this looked absolutely remarkable, new discovery and so forth. Yeah. Well, this reproduction uh, in, in this periodical uh, immediately put an end to such speculation. Uh, certain auction dealers wanted to get it. You know, they felt it would bring 50 or $60,000. So here again, I said, this is great for the collection. Uh, they were unwilling to accept it and after some years. Finally, they came around and sold it to me. <laughs> so that's how the, huh? yeah, so, so sometimes you need patience even collecting forgeries. That's a whole <laughs> other story. Uh, all right, so now uh, we will go to one of the most intriguing mm -hmm. miniatures. Uh, and of course, people were wondering, says, how could you? be so convinced without mm -hmm. any scientific testing that this thing was bogus. I mean, it looked like real 14th century, the writing, the initials, the music, it all looked so good. And the subject was fascinating. It was about the miraculous icon of Beirut. Apparently a Christian had salvaged this uh, icon uh, of the crucifixion 
And then his fellow Jews uh, uh, thought that he was a clandestine Christian. This is at the top, and they threatened to kill him. He says, oh, no, oh, no, I'll prove that I'm really a Jew. So he takes his spear and pierces the icon of the crucifixion. The blood comes out, and, of course, everybody is converted. So that's the story, but very rarely reproduced. So I was interested in, in that aspect. But the thing that intrigued me most was that this was a palimpsest manuscript, uh, and you can see showing through, wasn't quite erased, Hebrew writing. Yeah, can you explain that term? Yeah, a palimpsest is a manuscript uh, where the text has been scraped and it was reused. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I got uh, uh, my Hebrew scholars to look at this, and lo and behold, they discovered that this was the remnants of a ketubah, which is a Jewish wedding certificate, and they could actually read that it was the the, the groom was a certain Elisha Hayim, uh, who was married in Rome in 1712. Uh, well, since this yeah. is over that, mm -hmm. obviously it had to have been done after 1712, but it is an absolutely magnificent piece. Indeed. <laughs> so, so I also, yeah. Well, so this piece, um, you know, at first glance looks like a modern work of art, right? Um, so what is this? Well, uh, uh, this I found out about this because I was invited, and being at the Morgan, of course, I had entree into all sorts of things. So a lot of the things I got were somehow connected to the Morgan they were offered and so forth. Well, Christie's was having, in New York was having a sale of the Hawk collection. So I went to the preview uh, and I saw this and I said, what's this? And they said, well, it was claimed to be a Coptic manuscript, 5th to 7th century, containing the earliest representation of musical notation in the history of, of musical notation. And I said, oh, uh, I looked at it with considerable suspicion. <laughs> uh, so at the top, you have the choristers wearing sort of skirts uh, who apparently were doing the chanting and so forth. Yeah. So when the sale came up, uh, uh, I went looking for this, and it was withdrawn because it had been uh, demonstrated that it was bogus. But meanwhile, it was sold in 1952 at Bar as genuine, uh, and for the next... Uh, 14 years, a team of scholars of every sort, including people from the Metropolitan Museum, the Egyptian department, all conferred uh, that this was genuine. Mm. Uh, and of course, I looked at it and said, how can this be? These colored circles have no sign of wear or tear, unlike the rest of the, the, the vellum leaf. Uh, so then they informed me uh, that they uh, did a pigment analysis which apparently was not done in 1952, and they, they discovered titanium white. Uh, and that, as a pigment, was only available after uh, World War I. So that did it. But anyway, to read these scholars who came up with all these ingenious ideas, they noted, for example, uh, that the spheres on the left, that they, that they related to the harmony of the spheres of Pythagoras and so forth, uh, there are 12 of them, uh, that they represent the notes of the 12 scale. So each had a different color so that you would see on the scales here uh, what notes to play. And the bigger the sphere, the longer the note was held. So it was all very clever. But of course, with the presence of the titanium white, that sort of killed the whole thing. So I said, well, this is a perfect thing for my collection because it's so fascinating. And the Morgan has one of the great collections of Coptic art. Mm -hmm. uh, and manuscripts, and so that's why I was interested. And so I got it for a fraction uh, of what it was sold for in 1952 because it had been declared bogus, uh, and the consigner was happy to get rid of it, and I was happy to receive it because it's a fascinating <laughs> item. Indeed. Uh, so um, I won't go on more about that one because we have to move along. Uh, so uh, the the. At the Morgan, uh, if visitors come in with a manuscript that they picked up abroad or in Africa, it's usually something uh, that they were told was Coptic, 
uh, and usually it was an unillustrated Coptic manuscripts, and at the beginning and the end were horrible uh, pictures introduced. Uh, and we'd actually have at the Morgan a great uh, Ethiopian uh, manuscript, because these were all Ethiopian that were brought in, not Coptic, because the Ethiopian things were done into the 20th century. But in the 1980s, a number of royal manuscripts appeared at uh, uh, Sotheby's. Uh, and, they said, and of course, their reviewers said, last chance to buy a royal manuscript. Of course, they should have known better because Haile Selassie said that no important uh, royal manuscripts could leave without an export license. These all have export licenses. So somebody knew uh, that these things were not real. Uh, and of course, there was a big article that appeared in the book collector. And believe it or not, like with some automobiles that proved to be defective, Sotheby's had to recall these and give people their money back. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then one way or another, I said, I must have one of these for the collection. And this contains 41 full page miniatures. And they are done by an Ethiopian artist who was very gifted. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he captures the Ethiopian ethos better than some of these other works that have survived. But to do 41 of these, and you could see that they're painted over the text also. But they're absolutely glorious. Indeed. Uh, so that's how, that's how I got in, uh, into those. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's go on uh, to the next one. Um, now, uh, you may wonder, how do I know uh, that these were made after 1980? Uh, one of the advantages of being ancient <laughs> uh, and paying attention to the auction scene in New York is that suddenly in the early 1980s, pictures like this started appearing at all the local auction houses. Mm. Now, a forger is not going to sit on his output for years and years and years. He wants to sell them. He's got to get them out there. So the fact that these all appeared in the early 1980s is pretty good evidence that they were made at that time. Uh, but what they uh, did was to use real Persian pages. And you can see here, they're painted over the uh, text. But this guy, uh, I call him the erotica master, uh, he did a number of them that appeared at different auction houses. So you could actually ascribe them to this erotica master. Mm -hmm. uh, and this one shows uh, uh, Parvati's union with a man who may be Shiva. So it's terribly erotic. And the re and she's got, of course, four arms. And the reason that she has all those arms is it's a sign of power. The more arms you have, the more weapons you hold, the more powerful you are. So anyway, it is a, a wonderfully erotic image. And it is probably by an Indian artist who had some skill. And he noticed that the, uh, that the ladies have whiter skin than the men who are swarthier looking. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, uh, so she was actually the, the goddess of uh, love to begin with. And so here she is demonstrating that with her partner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so lastly, uh, 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 one might ask, well, were forgers ever taken to court? Mm -hmm. uh, we know that Federico Ioni, who's also represented, Centered in the exhibition with two book covers. Uh, he wrote an autobiography, which is worth reading because he tells you how it was done. And he claimed that uh, he was just creating these things. It was the experts who said that they were real. And even people like Berenson were selling them uh, as if they were real. So he just disclaims it. And one thinks of this other Chinese artist, Pai Shen Quinn. Uh, you may have remembered uh, reading about him in the newspaper. He was a Chinese person who came to America to study painting. And he was doing pictures in the uh, imitation of Pollock, uh, uh, de Kooning, and Rothko, selling them on Broadway in the 70s for several thousand dollars. Uh, and then, of course, some unscrupulous people realized that these look so much like the real thing uh, they could be sold as a real thing. Mm -hmm. And Nerdlers was selling these things by him for 50 to $60 million. Then the whole scandal broke. Yeah. So this 
Chinese forger, brought down the house of Nerdler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting story. Well, anyway, the first uh, uh, court record that we have uh, involved Albrecht Dürer. There was uh, an Italian printmaker named Raimondi who was making copies of Dürer's prints, including the Life of the Virgin, which we see here. And he even added the monogram uh, AD. And on some of them, uh, he also added his monogram. Well, uh, when Dürer found out about this, he was furious. So he uh, uh, entered a lawsuit in Venice in 1506. Uh, and the decision was not that uh, Raimondi could no longer make them, but he could not any longer use the AD monogram. So this was a celebrated uh, court case. Nevertheless, uh, Durer was furious. Uh, and uh, uh, when he did the second edition of The Life of the Virgin, he put a warning at the front. By the way, if people are going to do this, I can warned them that they may receive bodily harm. I mean, who is going to physically? Oh, yes, that's what he said. And he said, moreover, Emperor Maximilian did not permit the printing and selling of such fictitious miniatures in the realm. Well, 12 years later, in 1523, uh, the expression caveat emptor entered the English language. Buyer beware. Uh, so buyer beware uh, is my parting note. <laughs> buyer beware whether you're buying forgeries or genuine works of art. Uh, works, by the way, uh, by the Spanish forger are still being sold, I think, as genuine. Most recently, on September 29 of this year, uh, in the Thomaston auction in Maine, a panel by the Spanish forger, but it was it was described as uh, Renaissance work, was sold for $22,000. Now, I don't know if the auction house uh, announced at the time of the sale that I had written to them, explaining to them that this was a masterpiece by the Spanish forger or not. Anyway, if they did, it's sort of a record price for a panel by the Spanish forger. If not, they should uh, hang their head in shame. So I don't know how it was sold, but uh, according to the price listed, it was $22,000. Wow. So I, again, we can only say, buyer beware, whatever you're buying, and try to be informed. And hopefully during this little presentation, you've got some clues uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you can use uh, for forgery detection. And of course, in the exhibition, there will be, be many others, so you should all go and see the show. Well, the exhibition is open only to our campus community at, at the moment. Um, perhaps things will look better by the end of the semester. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers on that. In any case, um, it's already being anticipated and uh, people are, are looking forward to seeing it. And thank you, Bill. Uh, it's been a real delight uh, having this conversation with you remotely. Uh, I wish it had been able to take place in our gallery, but as we're learning, uh, perhaps even more people will now be able to uh, learn from your expertise in this uh, video and uh, be not caught off guard. <laughs> <laughs> so, right, well. So thank you again for joining us today. And Thank you for lending us your many fascinating objects for our current exhibition. So we'll say farewell and uh, until we see each other again, Bill. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you.